Ooh, what it is and what's up? Can a player just keep in touch? We are back with episode five of Mind the Game with LeBron James and JJ Reddick. Without further ado, enjoy. Game two, one of your most iconic shots. What game? Game two, 2009 conference finals. Oh, yeah. Over Orlando. Yes. I have a question about that play. Because that is an example of a, you know, off, off ball movement, catch and shoot three. Yep. So... If I remember correctly, hey, bro, the way Bronx, yep, yep, that's like what he's gonna be known by. Watch, I'm telling you, they're gonna make memes of that. Um, Mo was taking it out. Yep. Delante set like a flare screen for Ogalskis. Yep. Right. I can't right unhear here. it. He's saying yep after every sentence now. Am I? Am I? Am I tweaking? I think it was Pavlovich just kind of ran to the ball. Yep. And you were over here on this elbow. You actually never got a screen on that play. No, because I was supposed to. The play was for to fake up and go back door for the lob. And Turk played okay. it. And Turk played it per perfectly. Okay. So I faked up, and I tried to go back for the lob, and I said, it's not open. It's not open. So I just came to the ball. And, and Turk fucked that up. Yeah. My only issue on that play. I didn't even see Richard. He had a hell of a... Contest. Yes. He was guarding the ball. He was guarding Mo, yeah. Yeah, he was guarding the ball. I didn't see until after the fact. I never saw him. I never saw him. But you only I, saw Turk. I only saw Turk. The fact that he could remember that. Do you remember do you remember your first playoff game? My first playoff game. I do. What yeah. do you remember about it? I was nervous as fuck. That's what I remember. This was third year. This was third year. Third year. Figure out when was the last. Who did he play that third year? So what? It couldn't. It couldn't have been against the Pistons, right? No, that was that was. Uh, I think the round after. What was that first initial? Last time the Cavs were in the postseason. But that was just like my first year. Okay, I was like established myself in my first year. Second year, we missed the playoffs by maybe one or two games, and it's like okay, I'm here to like play ball, but I want to make the next step. I got to get this franchise to the postseason. And my third year, we finally made the postseason, and we our first game was against Washington at home. Mm. I was nervous as hell. Why do Why do you think? Like, what have you reflected on that? Why Why do you think you were more nervous Cause for that game than any other game? Well, it was two games. My first ever game in Sacramento, and then I, I didn't want to fucking lay an egg. I remember not my first game, but my, but my, but my first uh, college game, my freshman year. Um, I was playing junior college, and I remember the head coach um, wasn't too high on me. The assistant coach was very high on me, right? So I was in a point guard battle with another point guard who, who's my brother to this day. And I come off the bench. Like, I'm sitting on the bench. I come off the bench. I wasn't starting. And I'm sitting there. I'm like, oh, shit. And I'm sitting there watching the flow of the game. And I'm like, oh, wait, it looked fast. I check in, and I played phenomenal. And I literally never... Came off the bench uh, any game after that. I, I, I won the starting spot during that game. I remember being so nervous watching the pace of it, and I actually got to the floor, and it was slower than I thought. It was it was really, really interesting. Lay an eight. What'd you have? 32-11-11. I <laughs> 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 laid an egg, all right. Oh, man. And they lock a rope. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think yeah. I think I, yeah. I don't quote me on this. I think it was like 35 7 and 6 or 35 7 and 7 or something. Well, for the whole series? For the whole series. Oh my gosh. Yeah. With no spacing? Not no, not bad. Not not, not bad, bad for, for the first one. You've played in uh a ton of playoff games obviously. You you've won championships. Mm -hmm. Um There's a lot that's different about the playoffs in the regular season. What is it? What is different about the playoffs? In general, Game plans, for me, like. in, general, in general, we'll get to you specifically. Um, in general, um, as you know, as you've played in a lot of postseason games too, one possession can lose you the series. And compared to the regular season, you can get away with some slippage. You can get away, it's four and five nights, fucking tired. You know, it's a cold ass Tuesday night in Milwaukee. You know, you're like, holy shit. Not this Milwaukee team. I mean, obviously you get up for those guys, but in the postseason, one bad stretch. It could be a fucking 6-0 run. 
It could be a turnover here. It could be you didn't top you didn't top lock JJ when we told you we top locking him all series, and now he didn't seen one go in. Even if you there's times like where you you know you could win a playoff game, and because the way you finished the game. You already lost the second one. Mm. Uh, I want to talk about that top locking thing. I have an example for that. So, like in college, um, if, if if I'm guarding a shooter and and I get between him and the in, in his screen, right, and I force him down to back to the basket, I remember, I forget what team it was, but I got in between the defender because I'm, I'm trying to anticipate the down screen, right, and it, it was like it was like a designed reaction from the other team. It, it this blew my mind. So I'm in between, boom, right, I'm in between the screen. I do my job by forcing down. So now I'm chasing. But I didn't know they had another set screen on the other side for him to come off of. So now I'm chasing him. And I'm trying to beeline to break to the ball. So I, I go over the screen, right? And then he automatically flares to the corner. And it's just like, damn. When you're playing against people that are like have a great mind and, and they know how to set you up perfectly, like he had me where he wanted. Like he had two options. Was to come off the double screen? Or if I, as they say, top lock it. Then he's gonna come back and go towards the basket and come off of a single where I try to fight. I try to shoot the gap and he flares to the corner. You don't let you don't let that fucking guy or that person get into a rhythm in the fourth quarter because you decided you didn't want to lock in for eight to nine more minutes. And yes, we won the game, but now we may lose the war. Yeah. The mental side of the playoffs, by the way. Thank you. Yeah. Particularly. Uh, against a really good opponent. Yeah. I think it was in episode one you said, the further you go in the playoffs to win, yeah. you have to be a high IQ team. Yep. It's, uh, it's obviously emotionally draining. Damn, look at his legs. Damn. Mm -hmm. Because of the, there is pressure. It's different. You feel more with each win and loss. Mm-hmm. You get to two losses in a series. You get mm -hmm. to three losses mm -hmm. in a series. An elimination game. It's you're down three two. You've got to go on the road to San Antonio. They won the championship last year. You've got to muster up enough yeah. to beat them to get back home. Yep. That emotional toll is a lot. The physical toll, of course, playing. But right. To right. me, like the mental side of it, I think that is a huge separator because oftentimes mental mistakes within a game can lead to a series loss. For sure. I think about one I made. I was in Orlando. We were playing in the conference finals against Boston, and I had played a good game. And there was a timeout. Let's say there was 29 seconds. There was a, a five or six second difference between shot clock mm -hmm. and game clock. And go to the timeout. I know we have a timeout. I know we have a timeout. We get to stop. I get the rebound. You dribble. First, no. First, I looked at Stan. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying it was his fault. Right. I looked. I knew there was a timeout. Mm -hmm. I knew I was. I should have called a timeout. And I looked at him, and, and he looked, didn't do anything. Uh, so then I just instinctively put the ball on the floor, and then he called a timeout. Yeah, mm -hmm. now you can't advance the ball. So now we got three seconds, and we've got to take it out three-quarter court, yep. opposite foul line. Yep. And we didn't get a good shot off. Mm -hmm. Now, we were down. Yep. I don't know that we... We right. win anyways, but that's an example right, of, right, like, right, a right, mental right. mistake. Yeah. I'll give you another one. And this one has bothered me for four years. <laughs> and I'm not throwing this guy under the bus because I think his intention was right. Which means, technically, you're going to throw somebody under the bus. <laughs> um, 2020 playoffs, conference finals. You guys are up 1-0 on Denver and you're down at the end of the game. You've got the ball underneath the basket. Three-point shot. Mason Plum Plumlee checks in the game yep. to guard Anthony Davis. Yep. You are on the left elbow. Anthony Davis is on the right elbow. Danny Green makes some cut or whatever, and Anthony Davis runs to the left wing. You never set a... Yeah, I don't know what... I remember watching this live, right? And when Mason Plumlee beelined for Grant to push him out, it, it blew my mind because makes some Braun isn't whatever. even looking at Plumlee. Like, Braun's not and even Anthony setting Davis. a screen. Like, it would be different if Braun turned and set the screen. Okay, I get it. Then you would push Jeremy Grant out. But Braun is literally Runs back down. towards Anthony Davis, and Plumlee just wing. automatically, like, 
He bailed them out. Grant Grant is Grant is guarding Braun because Braun's trying to seal him off. I don't know what Plumley was thinking right there. That's a brain fart. You never set a pick. In right. fact, your back was turned to Anthony Davis and Mason Plumley. Correct. Because I was just looking at Doe, like, <laughs> give me the ball. I know. And Mason Plumley po point switched. Yeah, he point, point switched. switched. And Anthony Davis hit the game winning three. Yeah. Now you're down 2 0. Just like that. That stuff, the little tiny plays. It's weird because in the playoffs, I would say the little plays get amplified more. Does that make sense? Yep. Versus a regular season, you go through 82 games. It's It doesn't feel the same way. Yeah. That's why my body I think, too, because you have, it, like, days in between games, so it's just super intensified and magnified. I think it's so bad throughout the regular season because I'm trying to gear them up for the postseason because – don't understand. Some guys don't understand. Like it's one play, like you're saying, one play can be the difference between your ass going home and going to Cabo or Cancun or wherever the hell you're going, or going to Disneyland or Disney World with the trophy in your hand. Do you think the the sort of game within the game of coaches is different? Meaning. Like, but I don't know. Bob Myers maybe ne didn't originate this, but I know that he said it at some point. There are 82 game players, and then there's 16 game players, right? Do you think that in some ways there are regular season, like good. Why would the mailman like ring the doorbell for what? And coaches versus good playoff coaches. Like, how much does coaching matter in the NBA in the playoffs? It matters a lot. Preparation. How much prep are you getting going into a series to win? You get out there and you're kind of ready for, you know, everything that's going to be thrown at you. And obviously everybody makes adjustments and then you got the great yeah. players that don't matter what type of fucking game plan you got on them. They're going to exploit it no matter what. But as much as you can be prepared going out for a, a, a series, and you know, you know, it changes. You know, that game one is kind of like the filler game, you know. You almost like tell your players, just go out and just fucking play. Like, just go out and play game one. Don't think too much, because if you start thinking too much, now you can't even just, like, be – you can't even just be a player no more, because now you're just trying to think the game. But me personally, I I, 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 want, I want overload. You want overload. I want overload. I, I want all the information, everything, everybody, every individual, every pros and cons. And I don't do that throughout the 82-game regular season. I'm not – I don't have the time to do that. I don't have the time. I, the, the league has changed a lot with practice time, shoot around time, amount of time you spend in the film room. It just has. Yeah, it has. And you know, I was I was fortunate. I would say fortunate. Five of my first six years, I played for Stan. I also played for him my la you know my last year in, in New Orleans. In New Orleans, but yeah. You, when you talk about the preparation, it was interesting to me that he prepared for a regular season game the same way he prepared for a postseason game. Yeah. So we're in shoot around for an hour and a half. We got knee pads on. We're going live. He would, I remember. You got knee pads on, huh? You're going live. Wow. That was crazy. At the end of shoot arounds, <laughs> he'd be like, all right, these guys haven't run this play in five games. This is an ATO, but they haven't run it in five games. But just, we, I want to be prepared for it. Let's go through it. Oh, you guys didn't do it right. Let's go through it again. That's right? the Rouse tree. 100%. That's the Riles tree. Spoke the same way. So when we got, but w my point is, when we got to the playoffs, it didn't feel any different. Right, because you when was we already were prepping prepared. for a playoff. Yeah, for game. sure. That's Spoke the same way. That's the Riles tree. You, you know, you come from that Pat Riley tree. That's just, you prepare every day like it's your last, for sure. I like that. You, you mentioned the word exploitation again. <laughs> How much mental energy in a playoff series, playoff game, are you spending on exploitation? How to exploit the other team? You personally. 48 minutes. Yeah. And if, it, if we need 53 or <laughs> 58, the whole game. How can you, because I'm trying to generate easy buckets. Easy buckets, and I want to get my guys in a rhythm. And how can we exploit the matchups and the players that's on the floor. And I, sometimes I get a little disrespectful to it as well. If certain guys come on the floor, I'll, I'll say it right on the free throw line while we shooting a free throw, they're shooting a free throw. 
Yo, we putting him into action. Thumb, thumb down him. Yeah. <laughs> I want him to know that, like, you know, we going, we going at him in the I, postseason. I'm glad I never played against you in the postseason. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I did. Nine yeah. minutes. In Nine game minutes two. in game two. <laughs> <of the laughs> 2009. <laughs> um, I think the other, the other thing phenomenal. for me in in playing and in watching is can you create good offense down the stretch? That's true, yeah. of course, in any basketball game. Yeah. I think it's harder and harder the further you go in the playoffs. Yeah, it is. I mean, obviously, the, the, <clears throat> the IQ, which I always come to, the IQ from the coaches to the players heighten and get better as you go on and on and on and on. And once the players get better, too, as well, I feel like being able to execute certain certain guys are able to execute better than others and teams or whatever the case may be because nothing nothing bothers them in the, in the pressure moments. That's interesting because I remember in high school um, it was the NorCal championship. We're playing Bishop O'Dowd um, against Ivan Rab, who uh, I think I drafted by the Grizzlies. Um, after he went to Cal University. And we had DJ Wilson, who went to Michigan and drafted by the Bucks. Yeah, right. Um, not yet, yeah, right. But, I mean, yeah, uh, that was correct. Um, and during the game, right, during the whole season, during the season leading up to the playoffs, we won off talent, like a lot of talent, good coaching. But we primarily just had good chemistry, great talent. And we got to Bishop O'Dowd, and we played him earlier in the season in, like, January, about two months prior. And they beat us by double digits. Um, at University of Cal, it was like the MLK classic game, and they dominated us, man. Uh, we didn't we didn't come into the game prepared, so this time around coming into the North Cal Championship, uh, we're way we're way more prepared, way more coached. I mean, I mean, just way we were just way more like everything was just intensified because it's just, it's it's like we win this one game, we play modern day against Stanley Johnson for the state championship, right? So during the whole game, it's a cat and mouse, man. It's a cat and mouse. Like coaches are playing chess, right? Our coach, their coach. And it just got to a point where I'm looking at their sideline. I'm like, damn, they got us. Um, they were just way more prepared than we were prepared. Like, I thought we were very prepared, but they were just so every, – every minor detail was executed from them, from holding signs up, from coaches calling out plays, echoing it along the bench. Their, their bench was way more in tune than our bench was throughout the whole game. All that stuff matters, man. All that stuff matters. And we, we at the end of the day, got out coached. Not necessarily – that didn't mean we didn't have enough talent, but our talent got us to that point. But during a certain amount of time, during that second half, we just got out coached. And there was nothing we could do. Nothing we could do. Sometimes the lights are too bright yeah, for certain individuals. And you know, I, 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 he, he, I would say this, though. Here's the thing. That's a fair point. I'm not disagreeing. <laughs> not disagreeing. <laughs> for my career, I think I shot 41% in the regular season from three. For my career in the playoffs, I think I shot over 37%. Yeah, but that's not because of the pressure. No, 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 but, I, but hold on. Oftentimes, our, our, our opinion on things are, are shaped by our own experience. Is that fair? That's fair. Let you and I have had different experiences as basketball players. Let me hear your right? experience. So later on in my career, once, pretty much once I got to L.A. and was like a starter and third or fourth option on offense, you get to the playoffs – they treat you like a first option. Yeah, for sure. Do you know, do you know what I mean by that? Yeah, like they've, yeah. they've come up with a very specific game plan. The same team mm -hmm. for game one, game two, game three, mm -hmm. through game seven. Yep. They've come up with a specific game plan for you. So Utah Jazz 2017, we are going to top lock him as soon as he crosses half court. I mean, Dr. Rivers said to me after game one, he said, this is not your series. I need you to stand in the corner. Right, a terrible series. It's the worst series of my fuck in my in my like playing career of when I was like actually a player, not not like a bench guy, but like right. a, it was the worst series of my career. Well, because having a shooter like that that can knock down shots opens the offense up. So if you take out the shooter, even if he's the third or fourth option, your offense shrinks. But he's like, you got to go stand in the corner. They're literally we're playing four on four without you. I'm like all right, right, the closeouts. So if I do create separation or if you do make a mistake in the kick, the closeouts are different in the playoffs. Yes. So my catch and shoot time to get a clean release is different. 
I'm not making excuses. No, I'm just telling you <laughs> it is the truth. what I experienced. So do you think because of that? By the way, 37% is not horrible. No, hell it's no. It's not, not good. Horrible. It's not good for me. I mean, for I'm you, upset. it's not. It's, it's terrible. For you, it's terrible. It's, it's terrible it's, for it's you. Terrible. It's terrible. Yeah, it's terrible for it's you. It's terrible. I mean, for the average guy. I'm embarrassed. They, they will fucking, <laughs> I'm embarrassed. They might get a max contract over there. But for you, you should, yeah. But that's why I, I believe certain guys, once the postseason start, because they've been guarded a certain way for, what, September to mid-April? A certain way. You know, you have certain games that, that gets, you know, circled on the calendar that certain yeah. coaches get up for, certain yeah. players get up for. But at the end of the day, You've been guarded a certain way. And then in the postseason, like you said, the closeouts are different. The preparation is different. Guys, guys are they're they're not allowing you to do what you do best because at the end of the day, if certain guys get off on a team, you're definitely gonna lose. Well, it's tough too. I mean, well, it, it in playoffs it makes sense because you have a seven game series. Seven games to win four. So you're watching so much film and you're overloading your mind, like LeBron's saying, on watching that one team. Um, and that's what differentiates from high school, college to the pros because there's not necessarily series in high school and college. You know what I'm saying? You get one game to prepare, one game, or, 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 or one practice. Or not one practice, but you get one opportunity to prepare for that one game. But this you have the first game, the fill-out game, and then you have the adjustment period of games two and three, and then it goes on, so on and so forth. So I, I, I love watching NBA playoffs, man. If I'm playing the Clippers, you got okay. You got to deal with Blake and his points in the paint and his rolls and his pocket passes from CP. You got to deal with CP. You got to deal with Jamal coming off the bench and, and doing what he does off the bench. If we allow JJ to get five or six threes, the series is over. If you shoot, if you can five or not, not fuck making five or six threes. If JJ's shooting five or six threes, we're gonna lose. Yeah. Interesting. The, the Spurs series in 15. I remember, dude, right, we come out game one. We're in L.A. We've got the three seed. They got the six seed, even though we had the same amount of wins. And Kawhi's guarding me. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, You're like, like what, what, did I do? what did I what did do, I do to deserve, to deserve this? this? Why are you guarding me? And for, I don't remember, maybe the first four or five games of the season, he started on me. Danny started on CP. Right. Then they switched that in game six. I think it was game, I know game seven, Danny yeah. was on me. Um, and at the end of the series, we win. And like, I didn't have a great series, yeah. but I had big moments in the series. You know, and at the end of the series, Chip England came up to me. He was like, man, our, our entire thing was like, we got to, we can't allow you to get off. See, I wasn't we even part of We threw the ki kitchen sink to you. Yeah, I wasn't even a part of that. I I've seen Pop in the postseason. I've played against him multiple times in finals appearances. There was one time where, where so it, w the, he called a timeout with like 11 minutes and 52 seconds left in the first quarter. Because a guy on our team got off a three. Yeah. I don't even know if they made the damn three. But he called a timeout right away. <laughs> got on Danny Green. What the fuck? Danny Green got on his ass, took him out, <laughs> brought him back in. But obviously they had something in place and then they executed. Yeah. Um, Two, two last things, I, I, points I want to make on the playoff, or one, one last point, and then I want to actually get your perspective on something. I, I think what's, what's different about the playoffs. So to your point about still winning a game, but maybe an adjustment's made late in the game, yep, yep. and you say, we, we won the game, but uh, they, they may have figured something out, yep. right? I think what's different is if you make that adjustment with six minutes to go in the third quarter, and you come back, still lose the game. The next night, you might be playing Memphis. The next night, you might be playing Oklahoma City. The right. next night, you might be playing Portland. Right. So you might have to wait two months. Right. In the playoffs, you make an adjustment. You feel like you can exploit something. It's the same damn team. Same damn the team. Next night right. or same person. Yeah. 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 You figure. And you so that's out. where you see, like Dallas in eleven. You remember JJ Barea against the Lakers. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, they, they, JJ and Dirk can pick and roll. They, they can't stop. Well, that. I mean, yeah. even, even, even against the Heat, Dallas, Dallas goes down two one, and then the Heat don't win another game, three straight. 
that's that's adjustment based, in my opinion, and also just lack of performances from the guys. But I mean, that's a huge adjustment to win three straight. Yep. We're just going to exploit that over and over. Yep. Um, what's your perspective on luck in the playoffs? Need it. You Give me an example. The biggest example of like luck in the postseason. In your in your experience. Oh, in my experience. Uh, trying to think of my championship runs. I mean that that Denver series had a little bit of luck in there. That that AD shot because Plumlee just happened to luckily go into your favor and go under the screen that wasn't there. I mean, I was on the team. That's the luck, right? I, mean, <laughs> <laughs> I can't think off the top of my head. But no, no, seriously, that guy. Like, you know, you could be a great team, but you need a little luck. You need the ball to bounce your way sometimes. You know. You need to, you know, a, a certain player on the opposing team get in foul trouble, you know. It's just, I don't know. I mean, off the top of my head, I'm, I start to think of, like, what, what, what unfortunately what happened with Kawhi with the Zaza Pachulia thing. You know, I, the Spurs was. They were good. Yeah. They were fucking good. Yeah. And they were handling the shit out of Golden State up until that point. I think they were maybe up. I can't, I don't Almost know, maybe we can always look it up. I was, yeah. They were up 17, yeah. you know, and they were very fucking good. And, you know, you get Kawhi go down with the ankle, and it's like, oh, shit, the whole thing changes. It's, uh, you know, like, I don't know off the top of my head as far as, you know, my experience. I can't believe Zaza, bro. That, shit, that actually pissed me off. I'm even a Spurs fan. Experience, but you, luck, you want to say it's always, you need, yes, you need it. You need some luck, for sure. You definitely do. I think it goes back to where we kind of started this with the one play where a lucky bounce, an unlucky bounce, a call, yeah. uh, a guy reacting to something, 2016. Yeah. <laughs> An injury, right? A, a, a play, a, a moment. Play, a moment, right? yeah, for sure. And it's not, I think luck maybe is the wrong word. It's but not it's dull. like an inflection point almost of like, Someone gets hurt. That can change shot. the trajectory. Yes. To the trajectory of the of of what's to what's to come. Yeah. I mean, you look at what is it? The O one Lakers Kings. I think that was. Was it luck? We got cheated, brother. I know we didn't make free throws. I know, I know, but we got cheated, brother. And then Vlade Divac just happened to spike the ball out to Robert Ory for game. That was luck. Or it might have been purposeful. Game five or six, maybe. And they get the tip out to Big Shot Bob. Yeah. Like, everyone, I think Kobe, Kobe, missed, Kobe missed a floater. Like, over Doug. Like, grab, yeah. grab the like, effing ball, Vlade. What, what, yeah, like, like, Kobe, what are you Kobe doing? Missed. Grab it. What are you slapping the ball out to? It's one person out. It's five people in the paint. It is five people in the mother effing paint. And you slap Kobe it. Missed a floater to, you, over Doug Christie, I think. And then Shaq gets and yeah, gets a yeah, tip yeah, out. Yeah yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, Vlade, he's driving. Vlade yeah, exactly. It tipped it, it out, right like, to big. Yeah, right to Robert Dory. Like if you clean glass on that, that's that's the game. Yeah. And it's like, how many times a, a, a ball gets batted right into one of the biggest clutch players in NBA history at the top of the key, and he just at the at the end of the game, bang bang. Yeah, that's, that's some Six luck. Months. There's some luck to that. Stomach. Complete transparency. We actually got up and sat back down because we had to say this. Game six. I don't know how I forgot. Ray about that. Allen's three. Yeah, I don't. The sequence of events here. Yeah. Yeah. That led up to that. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I, the first thing that comes to mind is that <sighs> they lose it that year. <sighs> one and two. They go one and two in three years. <sighs> boy, boy. You know, Pop had took. Timmy D out, yeah, you know, and I think because you know they could probably was looking to switch everything because we needed threes, we needed threes, so a lot everything was going to be on the perimeter. I had literally just made one three before that, and uh, we ran one of our plays that we've been practicing all year, where I would, you know, come and set the pick like we just kind of like we drew up on the whiteboard. I would, I would flare over the top and then come back, and uh, I I missed that one and. Who knows if Timmy D's on the floor? Does he clean glass? He's cleaned glass a lot in his career. But Bosch is able to, you know, get the rebound over Manu. Manu kind of falls down a little bit. 
he's kind of on the back, he cleans glass, and then Ray backpedals, doesn't even look at the line. What if he step? What if he steps on the line? Backpedaling. What if KD. he steps on the base? What if his toes on the line? What if his toes yeah, on yeah, the yeah. line? There's some a lot of preparation because I watch Ray do that every day, prep yeah, yeah. like that. But I believe there's some luck to that too. The thing I always think about with that play, and this is gonna sound weird and it's gonna make me look bad. <laughs> It will, but I will take it. Manu was such a fucking psychotic competitor. I think about him going for that rebound. If I was in that situation and saw the ball bounce, and this is not revisionist history, I'm just being honest with you, and I'm guarding Ray Allen. You don't leave. I'm staying at home. Always. But Manu is Manu. He wants that rebound to close he want, the game. He wanted to tip it out. Yep. He wanted to close the game close out, the game. win a championship. Yep. Like, I'm not, this is, I'm not knocking what he did. No, no, for sure, yeah. And had he not fallen, it wouldn't even have mattered. Right. But he's such a competitor. He mm -hmm. went for it, and he fell. He failed. And that was all that Ray needed. That's all he needed. Do you want to handle this? <laughs> I don't, I've never met this guy in my life. So I don't, I don't even, uh, first guest on our show. I don't first guest. I don't even know. Who, no, this is uh, my guy, fucking Coach Keith Danbrot, man. My high school coach really taught me a lot about how to prep, prep for the game, how to play the game. And uh, shit, I wouldn't be here in this seat right now where I am in my career without him. That's for that's for damn sure. That's for damn sure. He will say that. he's gonna say the same thing about vice versa. No, but like he literally like wow. taught me how to take the game serious. Like seriously, like every day at practice, how to prep, how to prepare. Like, you know, me and Maverick always talk about like our games were so easy because we practiced so fucking hard. He was like, this is gonna be the hardest thing y'all do on this practice court. When we get in the games, it's gonna be easy. And as a player, you don't really believe that shit. When you're 14. Yeah, every coach should abide by that though, honestly, 100%. 15, 15 years old, you're like, I'm fucking dying out here, man. What are you talking about? The game's gonna be easier. Like. The competition he's got, all these, and he was absolutely right. So I learned how to, what I learned from him was how to really prepare for the games before the games ever, ever took place. What was LeBron like when you coached him? <laughs> <laughs> you had him freshman and sophomore year? I had him as freshman and sophomore. I met him, I think, when he was about 13 and a half, maybe. Yeah. Um, he was one of the easiest guys I've ever coached. And so I was a college coach prior to yeah. coaching him. Um, and once I saw him, I called some of my friends and I said, you know, I got a guy that I think is one of the best I've seen. And they all kind of laughed at me and they say, oh, you, you sound like a high school coach now. <laughs> you know how the high school coach always hypes guys up sometimes. Facts, but facts, facts. Just easy guy, great teammate, cared about, you know, playing as a team, uh, loved his teammates, played hard. But the biggest thing that jumps out at you is just his innate ability and his ability to learn. Interesting. You used the, the word innate in the first episode. Yeah. I thought you were full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad somebody co-signed it. Yeah. <laughs> when, when you when you teach basketball, you just you just retired. Congratulations. Congrats, Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Congrats on a hell got, of a career. You got a win in the tourney. Yes, um, sir. When you teach basketball. Is there a difference in approach between teaching high school kids or college kids? That's a great question. So uh, I had always been a college coach. So when I had that group, I treated them like college players. And they actually had the brains of above that. And then once I knew LeBron was going to be a pro, because I had had three NBA guys before him, then I started to treat him like he had to guard Kobe in four years. So that's really how mm. I treated him. I treated him like Damn. a pro. That's interesting. Did you feel Kobe that? in four years? No. Did you not know any different? No, no, no. I didn't know no difference. I mean, I'm just going out there and just like, I'm gonna just bust my ass, and this is the guy that's he's the he's the head coach, so whatever he says, let's let's do it. Like, and like we all came together, like me and my high school boys, you know, we all came to St. B for a reason, and we wanted to win. We wanted to win a state championship. We wanted to win, you know, Maverick was doing, you know, recruiting before he was supposed to be doing it and shit, recruited me to St. V. But, um, but yeah, I just wanted to win. So, like, you know, there was times where you'd be pissed off at him because you're not, you're not used to it. You're not used to, you know, this type of, uh, you know, this type of hard work. It's something different. 
You know, remember I, t- I was telling you in episode one how, how how different it is going from, you know, just from grade school to middle school, you know, the intimidation factor of even just yeah. walking down the hallways. Facts. And then going from middle school to high school is even more intimidating. Now you're like being around kids with like beards and like people are driving to school. Like I'm a freshman in high school. I don't, I drive, I'm riding my bike or one of the coaches pick me up, whatever the case may be. So, you know, it, it was a super duper different in a sense of anything else I had been up, up until that point by playing the game of basketball. How, how long did you coach total between high school and college? Well, I had a little sabbatical, so let me, let me think about that. So I was seven years at Duquesne, 13 at, um, at, at Akron as a head coach, Dang. and three other years as an assistant, so close to 35 years. How do you coach a player that can't remember after timeout plays? Coming out of a timeout. <laughs> <laughs> I've played with players like that, man. Um, I remember this one time, I think it was in high school, and we're drawing up a play. And a lot of us kind of know the basis of the play, right? Coach is going to draw up a play that we pretty much already practiced. So it's not going to be nothing new. We're just, he's drawing it from a certain area where we're inbounding the ball. We get out there, and one of the players lines up on the total opposite side, right? So we, we catch it too late. By the time the ball is, we look, we're like, fuck. He's supposed to be on the opposite side because he's not supposed to go towards the ball. So he goes towards the ball, ruins the whole play. I'm saying, like, stuff like that, like, pay attention. It, it, it irks me. It irks me. Coming out of a timeout, you drop a play, and a player habitually forgets what he's supposed to do. As a coach, how do you coach that player? That's funny because we were just talking about that last night. I may have got some intel on that. (laughs) So really what you do is you have an assistant coach that is assigned to that guy. And after you draw up the play, he draws it, redraws it up and then tells him again about it. Because there's nothing more frustrating as a coach and even as a player than somebody butchering up plays when they're when you draw it up for them. I, I, uh, LeBron knows this. I, I coach my son's travel team. It's a fourth grade travel team, nine and ten year olds, and uh, there's not there's not a ton of like opportunities for to old. call time. Yeah, like, yeah, I'll, right. I'll drop I'll drop the first play. If right. we have the ball at halftime, I'll yeah. drop it up. I think each team is allowed like three timeouts, and you know if there's opportunities, I'll draw it up. We we have the ball because a, a lot of times if if we score on another team, they call a timeout. You don't have chaos, time. chaos is going to ensue <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. at the change of possession, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's just like, but it's interesting because I, 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 I have to deal with that, right? And the one thing I, I've, I've learned this season, because my second year doing it, is I tell the kids, not every kid, but I tell the kids that need to hear this, just watch what you're supposed to do. Yes, yes, yes. Especially at that age. If you're worrying about X, Y, and Z at a certain age, you forget what you're going to do. But as a kid... If you know your role, everybody knows their exact role in that play. The play will work seamlessly. That's a There's point. a lot of stuff happening. Just watch what you're That's supposed to do. That's a good point. It's really good. I think the hardest, the hardest thing, and this is where— But as a point guard, sorry, I keep pausing. I'm, I'll let it run this. As a point guard, you are supposed to know all five positions, including yours, every single play. The progressions from every single play. Option one, two, and three. Like this. So it's like point guards have to know more. But if you're a position, if, if, if you're outside of a point guard, shooting guard, small forward, center, power forward, whatever the case may be, you really don't have to know every single part of the play like the point guards do. I'm, I'm curious for both of you, coaching it and having coaches do this, ATOs are such a sp- very specific thing. Mm-hmm. And a big part of running an ATO correctly is timing. And so practicing ATOs, like did you practice your ATOs? Did you have a list of certain plays that were ATOs that were outside of your normal sets or concepts? And have you had coaches that actually practiced ATOs? So I know a lot of coaches do that, but I kind of I'm kind of a coach that plays off the feel of the game. So I'll I'll usually run one of the sets that I think is gonna go at that particular time. That way you're not as limited as to what you can run at a certain time. Right. But obviously we've practiced all of those. And we probably spent more time this year, for instance, just on five on O, just making sure our guys knew every little aspect of it. And you make a great point. You can run a great set, but if you don't execute the screen or the cut or understand how to bump a screen or go tight off of a screen, none of it really matters. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think what you were saying, Jay, I think there's a... Practicing 
some ATOs is uh, is very bene beneficial to the certain teams. But also as a player, sometimes when a coach comes to the timeout and draws something that you haven't seen before, mm -hmm. you kind of get like, oh, shit. <laughs> I ain't seen this one before. I'm, yeah. Like, we, I'm going to execute this one to a T because if it works now, we might can bring this back again. Like, yeah. I want to, like, you know, as a player, you feel good about that. Like, oh, I know you had that one in your bag, coach. So, like. Yeah, you know, you have certain things that... I wonder if in the NBA they, they draw up their ATOs or they practice them. Or, like, everything they draw... Or, or is everything they draw up brand new? You know, I always ask myself that. Like, are they drawing up new plays or are these plays they practice? You know, you have a fourth quarter package. You know, you have a, you know, ATO. You have, you know, SOBs, BOBs that you don't, you know, want to run throughout the course of the game. So, because if it's a closed game, you want to try to catch the defense, you know, sleep in or catch them off guard or whatever the case may be. But... And, and, and the conversation that we're having throughout the course of a game, you want to kind of have things that's in place that you've kind of practiced just so guys have some type of mental, yeah. you know, knowledge of, okay, this is what we worked on yesterday or this is what we worked on in, the, in, in shoot around. But it doesn't always happen like that because, you know, coaches and players, like we want to, you want to do shit that you want to be able to make in-game adjustments that maybe you didn't have an opportunity to prepare for that earlier that morning or, Maybe it is a back-to-back, -back and you didn't really have shoot-around. You didn't have an opportunity to, you know, really put in, uh, you know, all the stuff that you may have wanted to put in if you had a practice day. So I think it's all situational. Yeah. The, the, t the reason I bring up the timing thing is because there are certain parts of after-timeout oh, sure. plays. Very important. When you cut. Yeah, for when sure. When you set the screen. Absolutely. Like, yeah, it, a big if it's like a delayed ATOs cut, yeah. Is misdirection. Yeah, for sure. Right? And so when that misdirection is occurring... That's important. Yeah, for sure. Right? The other the other reason I ask is because, uh, you know, I, I, Doc was great with this and Brett Brown was great with this, is end of game need plays. Yeah. So we had need yeah. two plays, need, two, need three, need three yep. plays, yeah. yep. and we would have a package. And by the way, that package would change throughout the season. Yep. So if we ran a, a play a couple times in a need three situation, and it didn't work, or whatever. Right. Yeah. yeah. Or even if it did, we oh, yeah. we we would yeah. have to yeah. we'd have to disguise it. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah. we'd have oh, yeah, to practice sure. that. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yep. Yep. And you mentioned something really good. I think, you know, obviously we can't advance the ball in college. Yes. So I do think some of your side outs can be plays that you run from the from a normal set so that guys can actually do the same thing. And then the, the ability to save plays for late in the game, too. Yeah. Like I always try to save three or four that I like to run late that I haven't run the whole game or like you said maybe put them in a closet for two or three weeks and then bring them back two or three weeks later I like to do right because yeah I think when when you're game playing for a team especially in college we might play a game on a Monday next game will be on Thursdays we have two and a half days to prep and watch film watch all your plays it's so easy to pick up on a team who runs all of their plays because you know that's all they got but if you're hiding plays when we get into that game you call something that we don't know oh man it's a game changer uh, based on the guys that you have coached throughout your career, what are the skills that translate and transfer from high school to college, college to the NBA? Well, I think, you know, there's a lot of guys that have talent, but there's a lot of guys that don't have a good enough brain to play in the NBA. You know, you have to understand the game. You have to understand, you know, what it takes to make the league. For instance, we had the Thomas twins who, who, uh, uh, LeBron knows that played for us at Eastern Michigan. Uh, one of nine twins that played in the NBA, free agent guys. Charles never averaged more than 11 points a game at college, but he had a skill set good enough to be able to play defense, be able to handle the ball enough, and shoot the three ball enough to play in the league. Kind of like and I Ronnie. think a lot of guys think they have to score to play in the league, but you have to be able to guard to play in the league. You have to be able to play a role. You got to you have to be a good role player because there's not many guys like LeBron. And I, and oh my God, I hate, I keep pausing, but he's preaching right now. I tell kids this all the time, young kids, I say, don't focus on scoring too much. Everybody always wants to ask, oh, how much did you average points? How much did you score that game? How much did you have last night? It, it doesn't matter. There can only be about one, two, maybe three primary scores on good high school, great college teams, right? Small percent of people are going to be those guys. For me, I was blessed to be that guy on all the teams I was on. I was, I was blessed to be an offensive threat, but it's like not everybody gets that role. So if you can... If you can master your role, whether it be setting good screens, doing the dirty work, diving on the floor, getting rebounds, playing good defense, there is more opportunity for you to make a roster doing that than it is scoring. Fact. Because you can find scores anywhere. You can't really find too many people that want to play defense and rebound at a high level. Those guys automatically always get a scholarship immediately. Are role players. So you have to yeah. be really good at something. 
Thanks. <laughs> I think you were a little more than a role player. No, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You um, yeah, absolutely. I got a clip that I sent <laughs> your ass the other day. Yeah, 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 exactly. I actually, I would, I would argue everybody's a role player. That's true. His role is just to be the guy, right? Luca's role is to be the guy. That's his role. The, 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 the connotation, there's a difference between definition and connotation, right? The connotation of a role player. Most 19 and 20 year olds don't want to hear that. Right. I'm going to be a role player in the league, right? And that, that to me is a struggle. And I, it's interesting you bring up the brain because I think part of the brain and part of, curious to get your thoughts on this too, part of lasting in the NBA, skill set, talent, size, strength, all that stuff, super important. Basketball intelligence, super important. What about emotional intelligence? What about being able to be a part of a group, be a part of a team, navigate locker room situations, navigate relationships with coaches, mm -hmm. navigate relationships in the training room? I think to some degree, that's maybe not equally as important because yeah. you need all the stuff beforehand, but to last in the NBA, you have to have a level of that. I mean, it goes back to the saying that I told you about one of my good friends, Jimmy Iovine, always talks about when the shit gets bigger than the cat, we get rid of the fucking cat. And what he's saying, basically in basketball terms, yeah. is a lot of players, when they're at their peak of performance, but on this, on the, on the side that you're talking about, they don't, they haven't respected authority. They haven't come in and just wanted to be a part of the group. You know, but they was averaging 25, 30, or whatever the case may be, and they were the shit. When that stuff starts to dwindle, and the shit is not as good as the individual anymore, they get rid of the cat. And 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 we see it in our sport. You see it in sports in general. You know, you you have to play the game to play the game as well. And at the end of the day, being a good person shouldn't have to just be dedicated to just sports. That's fucking life. Yeah. Just being a good fucking person. Hey, how you doing? Good morning. Okay. Am I having a bad day? Okay, I might be having a bad day. All right. Yo, you all right? Like, shit, like just normal shit. Like, if, if I'm walking to a door and a woman is by, beside me, no matter if she's a stranger or not, if she's an older woman or a younger, like, hold the fucking door open for her. Mm -hmm. Why? I don't understand. Why is that such a, like, we got to think, man, common sense ain't common. Shout out Jack Harlow. It's kind of crazy. That should be easy. That should be easy. But it's not. Not because everybody does. I had, I, had, I, had, I, had, yeah. I had vets my rookie year that were like, dude, you're coming into the practice facility. When you walk in a room, say hi to everybody. Acknowledge people. Right? I was in my shit. I wasn't playing. You know, I was right. upset. And you have to take that into account no, as well. No, no, no. But at the end and of the day, there is a... I was 22. Like, right. I was young, but, like, yeah, yeah, I think whatever. I think that helps you. You you last longer in a department that you want to be a part of because you just play the game a little bit. And no one's telling you to be fake. No, no, no. It's not It's not that. It's not being fake. It's just being it's being human. Like, be, yeah. a, be a fucking human being. And no matter what else, whatever you do. That's a fine line between being in the league and not being in the league, right? So when you go 12 to 15 or whatever, right, the coach doesn't really want to be around somebody that's not a good person if because there's somebody probably just as good as you or close to as good as you that you can play with that probably aren't going to play anyway, right, at that point. There's a lot of guys I know that I'm friends with that had 9 or 10-year careers mm. that never played more than... 10, 11 minutes in the game, never were really an 82-game regular rotation player, but they were great fucking dudes. Yep. And they lasted 9 or 10 years and maximized their career because of this very thing we're talking yep. about. And if you get that 10th year, you get that pension. <laughs> you get that pension, you get that health care. <laughs> you get that. Lifetime. Yeah. Um, the influence of the game in the NBA, European basketball, on the college game. We maybe had talked about this, and we haven't really like dove into this. It feels like at times when I watch college, there's a big difference between coaches who have embraced what I would call modern basketball concepts versus what I would call antiquated basketball concepts. 
where is college basketball right now with being influenced by either the NBA or EuroLeague or, or you know, world FIBA competitions just in terms of X and O strategy? So clearly in my mind, uh, the NBA has been influenced by the European basketball. And I feel like college basketball is two to three years behind the NBA. And the reason I say that is, for instance, when people started icing the ball screens, that took two years before it It's one of my favorite defensive plays. Once a big yells ice, oh, I love it. Only because this, if someone is setting a screen, right, on let's say the left wing, right, left wing, I'm facing the opponents. I mean, I'm facing our basket, right, I'm on defense. And the screen's coming to my right. And I hear big yell ice. Oh, it's I, immediately I jump that screen and force him downhill. And the reason why I like it is because if I ice it, of course the big is pretty much when you ice it, the big's gonna twist it, right? So the other big's gonna twist and screen me on the other side, on, on the on the left side, right? But I ha I now have the sideline to my advantage, and I'm forcing him down to the baseline where my big is kind of in drop coverage, right? So it's kind of like in, if, if you can execute it very well. On defense, it, it pays dividends. But if you get a, a good point guard who can snake the screen off the off the, your ice, then you're in trouble because then I'm coming around, chasing you back to the top where now you're in open space, and then it's a lot of shit that can happen in there. But if, you, if done well, icing the screen is freaking phenomenal. I love it. Love it. And it saves energy, too, if, if done correctly. Hit college basketball. Instead of fighting And then screens. everybody, to offset the ice, they started going to the elbow handoffs, right, the dribble handoffs. <laughs> And that took another two years before it hit college basketball. So the, the last thing probably that, that occurs is the, the ISOs and finding the elephant in the room, I call it. You know, the guy that can't T really target guard. Hunting. Yeah, that's like hunting. LeBron was talking about pointing it. We're going at him. Yeah. That's probably the last thing. And I, the, the one thing that's different is there's not as many great players in college basketball as there is in the NBA. So it's never going to look exactly the same. But I think the NBA has clearly been ahead of college basketball and will remain to be the driving force of college basketball. It takes takes coaches a long time to adjust. Like probably when you played some, they, they there was still some motion offense, right? You don't see hardly yeah. any of that anymore. Like no. we used to cover like down screens, back screens, low crosses. Now now what we do is we cover ball screens and dribble handoffs. And Sacramento and Kings spam the dribble handoff. It's, it's called like a dribble handoff renegade. Because we just run it so much. Split screens, you know, like you were talking about. That's yeah. that's that's all we cover. NC State was the only team in my four years in college, and that was later on after Herb Sendek had left, I believe, that iced a pick and roll. Boston College uh, still ran flex when they joined the ACC. Oh, I hate flex offense. Awesome. Awesome. So, I hate that. guarding it. Duds. They literally just ran the flex offense. Al Skinner, right? And, and that's all they ran. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I get the, the difference between... Or the, 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 I should say being behind on things. The one thing I have noticed particularly this spring in March Madness is there are some really good coaches that are being creative with non-shooting players, non-spacing players. So the difference, of course, between the NBA and FIBA in college is that you can be in the paint, Sit, right? Can't. And there are certain players. Not every. It's not like the NBA. The yeah. NBA is the best of the best. Great college team might have two or three NBA guys. Of those two or three guys, maybe one guy has a ten-year career. Mm -hmm. Right. That's yeah. just that's just the reality. So there's going to be players on the floor that you don't have to guard. And UConn does this with Danny Hurley. Um, I saw uh, the Baylor women's team do this at the end of a game on a need three situation. Is you use the non-shooter in the corner. You put the shooter either on the block or on the same side wing, skip pass, either uphill DHO, uphill DHO or a DHO or, yeah. to the, the guy, the person on the block. And Baylor used it to get a, a game tying three to send it into overtime. Yeah, yeah. because then that, his man can't really help on those hands. Exactly. So far away from So him. far away, you have to, I think that's one thing. And I think the other thing is using your shooters as screeners more, you know, both on the ball and off the ball, back screen, you know, mm. into a down screen or, or back screen into a ball screen, just trying to get your shooter involved. But your idea is a really good one because they're always late. You were talking about being late to the, the, to the handoff and the ball yeah, screen, yeah. the overreaction. Yeah, That's a sure. good good, good point. When, you, when UConn runs that play with uh, with their big guy, 
There's constant overreaction. They get slips. Yeah, they get sure. threes. I mean, that's, I mean, you saw it last year. I mean, obviously they're doing it again this year, but Jordan Hawkins got so much action yeah. last year over that because they had a non-shooting big out there. Obviously, Jordan Hawkins is being body to body, but X4, X5 that's guarding a non-shooter. He can't get back up the floor. I just want to draw one play. And not, no, I just want to draw one play. They're not used to being out there either. Right. right? I'm right. sorry. I got to draw. It's one like play. a fish out the water. Because I'm, I'm like, a, I'm like a, uh, especially in college, where these these people guarding non-shooters are literally did just you see, standing. I mean, I saw. Illi did you? See, I hate to bring it up, but Illinois went 55 real minutes without scoring a point versus UConn. And UVA has it's freaking insane in the first half, but went like. I don't know, close to an hour, 43 minutes without scoring an actual point. Yeah, it was, it was insane. Uh, oh, cheers, coach, man. Cheers, like cheers. Man. cheers man. Good All shame, right, man. so, like, if a team is top-locking a shooter mm -hmm. over here, let's say this is fluff. Yep. This is fluff. This is, like, the four-man going to screen. You've got your five over here. Yep. This guy's pulled all the way. This is where the ball is right this here. This is college. This is what I'm talking about. Yep. You set this up with the away screen. This defender jumps into a top lock. Yep. This guy is just sitting in the paint. You skip past it to the corner. Yep. Here's the uphill DHO. Yep. Now this guy's going to be late. Yep. This guy's out of position because he thinks this is coming. Yep. That's the, I, There are ways to get around the spacing yeah. issues in and like, and, like and, and the same thing he was saying, if I'm being top locked, right, and the big comes to the pick and roll, or sets the, the wide pin, if I'm the guy that's being top locked, I'm the shooter, I can go underneath, snake it, and set the ball screen on the ball handler. Now my guy's top lock. He can't switch. He can't help. Now the ball handler comes off naked. Yeah. yeah. Because my guy's only worried about me coming off to get a shot. I used to do that with Joel. Yeah. Remember our elbow two action? Yeah, absolutely. Left yeah. elbow. I'm in left absolutely. corner. <laughs> and a lot of teams would would top lock it. Yeah. And I would literally screen, just, you just walk my guy up so into two, Joel's you man. You screen two guys at Joel once. Joel would spin and he'd get a layup. Yeah, you, get two, you screen yeah. two guys at once. Yeah. That's great stuff. Uh, Coach. Before we let you go, and thanks for being our first guest. Well, thanks for um, having me. I got a question for you, and I'll ask LeBron this in two or seven years. We're not really sure. What are you going to miss the most about the game of basketball and about being around it every day? I just think that I'll answer it. What I miss is the camaraderie, the scheduling, the structure, the competitiveness. The fact you have on people, you know, um, I think one of the things that I always tried to teach LeBron was you're going to hit some rough moments, but you got to battle through. I think that's the biggest thing is these, these young people need advice as to how to handle adversity because what happens a lot of times is they get bailed out of adversity now. Nobody really teaches them what to do when they hit it because we've all been there, right? We've all, we've all been in some tough situations. Just when you think things are going great, something happens. And if you don't know how to handle it, it's really difficult. Phenomenal episode, man. Ladies and gentlemen. Episode 5, Mind the Game. We have this thing. We did. Beautiful.